my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's guest is Cassandra Cassia smith who's going to share her birth experience in Australia, where she had a home birth. At the end of this episode, I'm going to give a little sneak peek into the episode that will air on Thursday of this week, so be sure to listen to the end. Hi, Cassandra. Welcome to the birth hour. Hi. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to have you share your birth story today. Why don't we start off by having you tell me a little bit about you and your family? Oh, sure. I'm actually an American living in Australia (laughs) with uh, my husband, who is Australian. That's what brought me to Melbourne. We have a little girl, Ruby Banksia. She is now six months old, which is kind of (laughs) scary, like how fast time is just really going by. And our little pup, Winston. All right. Well, let's start by talking about finding out you were pregnant and how your pregnancy was and what type of birth you were planning for. We were really fortunate to get pregnant quite quickly. And before that, I knew absolutely nothing about birth or even pregnancy. I mean, I had never tried to get pregnant before. I didn't have too many friends who had kids. And if they did, they were like much older. So like I was really never around any babies. So when I did get pregnant, I just became like a birth fanatic. (laughs) I read everything I could get my hands on. I watched documentaries. I read birth stories. And it's just the more I read and watched, it really, it felt like home birth was the right choice for us. You know, I had watched, I think I've listened to your podcast and so many women mentioned the business of being born, but you know, that's what did it for me (laughs) really, Mm -hmm. as well as reading, you know, Ina May and uh, Sarah Buckley. Those women just completely changed my life and my views on birth and the rights of women in birth as well. So like I said, I just became a fanatic. (laughs) Yeah, it was totally the same way. I feel like the business to being born is like the gateway (laughs) for a lot of people. It really is. And I I remember one specific part, there's this um, doctor and she was saying how, I think maybe she worked in in like a New York hospital and she was saying how she had never seen a natural birth. And that just has always stayed with me. (laughs) I was like, well, what's going on then? Like, why aren't women having natural births? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the more I read and uh, I was like, oh, okay, I get it now. (laughs) Yeah. But um, yeah, I think that's just the, it just seems very over-medicalized in so many ways when Perhaps sometimes it isn't necessary. A lot of those resources that you found are based on American birth, right? So what what's the comparison there with when you're planning a birth in Australia? Oh, it's the same. I okay. mean, there are hospital rates. Like I looked at C-section rates for hospitals and I mean, they were still like about a third, if not higher. And Sarah Buckley that I mentioned, she wrote Gentle Birth, Gentle Mothering, and she's Australian. I mean, it's very, it's very similar. There's not a big difference. When you like look at hospital statistics and just the the overall culture, I think about you know mm-hmm. is is pretty much the same. Did you have any issues finding a midwife? I didn't, but what was tricky is that at the time we were living in Perth, and so and we were planning on moving to Melbourne, and I was uh, six months pregnant during that move. So when we found out we were pregnant, it was. You know, it was like, well, but I'm not going to have the baby here. And that's pretty much the equivalent of like moving from California to Florida. <laughs> so it's a it's a big jump. So while I, I basically had to find a midwife before I got to Melbourne, or at least I wanted to. And I found a great midwife basically on the Internet. I just searched midwives Melbourne. <laughs> mm-hmm. I called her. We started talking over the phone. And just, you know, when something just feels right. That's just how it felt. So we talked on the phone every time I had a scan or any time I, you know, had an issue or she was just so great. She was like, call me anytime, but we'll always talk and always keep in contact. So, I mean, even though we weren't living in Melbourne, you know, I still had regular contact with this lady that I never knew, but was going to deliver my baby. (laughs) (laughs) 
So once you moved to Melbourne, you were like six months pregnant, you said? Pretty much, yeah. And how were you yep. feeling at that point in the pregnancy? Fine. Like it was pretty, I mean, I had a very straightforward pregnancy, no real issues. Although I'm a 20 week scan, they did realize that I had a low lying placenta, but even the tech was like, you know, it's nothing to worry about at this point. You have so much going to do. Baby has so much going to do. So I called my midwife. I was, you know, I was kind of nervous. I was like, what does this mean? And she was like, well, what the tech said is, you know, it's correct. There is nothing you can do. So we just, but you, it probably will move up. So, and you know, that's something I had never heard of before. But like I said, I knew nothing about birth. And of course it did move up because they recommended me having another scan at 32 weeks. And they did find out that, okay, good news is placenta's moved up. Not so great news is baby is breech. But again, they were saying, you know, like it's still early, baby moves around all the time, you know, it's just nothing to worry about, Um, something to monitor, but, you know, nothing to worry about at this stage. And, you know, my midwife, she's so great. She was like, here's the thing. Even if baby doesn't move, we have lots of things we can do. Ina May has a great, I think it's called the Rebozo technique, if that's even how you pronounce it. She was like, you know, worst case scenario we have a doctor manually turn the baby at the end. So, you know, my whole thing was if my midwife isn't worried, then I'm not going to be worried. (laughs) That's awesome that you were able to put yourself in that mindset. Well, yeah, I mean, I just trusted her completely. Like Mm -hmm. she just always put me at ease if I was ever, you know, if you had questions or were worried about something, she was just, she has this very like calm nature about her. She's like, if I worry, then you can worry, but I'm not worried. So it's like, okay. Martina's not worried, (laughs) so we're okay. (laughs) Awesome. Well, how are you feeling in the weeks leading up to birth, or what were the first signs that things were getting started? Well, the first sign was I started having a hindwater leak. My due date was on a Friday, May 1st, and that weekend, I mean, (laughs) it's not incredibly glamorous, but I mean, that's pretty much what it was. Like, I just started leaking. That's completely why they call it a leak. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I called my midwife and she was like, okay, that's good. But, you know, we just need to determine if it is amniotic fluid. And with some details that I'll just, you know, spare you and the listeners, <laughs> we did determine it was a, a hindwater leak. And I was like, is that bad? Is that okay? Because, you know, I got on Google and if I can recommend anything to pregnant women, like, and if you're worried about something, do not get on Google. <laughs> call your doctor, call your midwife. I mean, it always jumps to worst case scenario, right? You have a headache, you get on Google and then you're like, oh, I might have a brain tumor. (laughs) Or at least that's how I am. (laughs) Yeah. I think a lot of people are too. Yeah. So she was just like, it's okay. But I just, to me, that felt like a complication and I didn't really have any complications. And, you know, I was like, well, what if this means I need to get induced and then I have to go to a hospital and I don't want to go to a hospital. Like that's not in the plan. And, you know, I remember we were sitting at my kitchen table and she was like, Cassandra, it's okay. In 24 hours from now, you could be holding your baby. Everything's fine. Again, like, I'm not worried. And I was like, okay, like, okay, Martina. But um, she was right. It was pretty much at four o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. We were having that conversation and Ruby was born at 401 on Wednesday, the next day. Oh, wow. So things picked up pretty quickly. Well, they definitely did because she suggested that she was like, how about you come to my clinic and we'll hook you up to the fetal heart rate monitor and then, you know, we can know that baby's okay. But she was like, you know, I'm not worried. I texted my husband because he was in class and I was like, I'm going to pick you up. We're going to go to the clinic and I'm going to get hooked up to the heart rate monitor. And then I was sure to include in the text, like, everything's okay. Like, <laughs> there's, there's no need to panic. I just, this is more for my benefit. And so when we were driving to her clinic, I was driving. And I felt this little sensation. And like, that's the only way I could describe it. <laughs> like, cause it wasn't like a cramp. It was just like a, oh, hmm, am I having a contraction? Cause it, but it was, you know, really, just really faint. And then I just remember looking at the time and it was like 5.33 and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna monitor this. And then 10 minutes later, sure enough, I had another little sensation. <laughs> And I was like, okay, I think maybe, maybe I'm in labor. Maybe this like just kickstarted something. And when I got to the clinic, she was like, how are you feeling? And I was like, I think I'm having contractions. I was like really excited. 
She was like, all right, well, let's hook you up to the monitor. And she did. And yeah, I was, and I had two contractions while I was hooked up. And she was super calm and just like, okay, well, let's keep in touch throughout the night, but you're going to have a baby soon. And I think I was still in disbelief because at that point I was five days overdue. And each day I was just kind of losing patience. (laughs) I was like, okay, come on, baby, we're ready to meet you. And then by the fourth day, I was like, okay, you're just hanging out in there and I'm uncomfortable (laughs) and we want to meet you. So let's get this show on the road. I think when I realized like, and my midwife confirmed that, yes, I was in labor, it was, I don't know, it was just kind of hard to believe just, you know, something you've been waiting for, for nine months. And then like, oh my God, it's here. (laughs) It's just, it's a wonderful feeling. So we got home and my husband uh, started setting up the birth pool and I just got in bed and I started listening to my hypnobirthing meditations because we had taken a hypnobirthing class, which was just absolutely wonderful. I had made little affirmations and I had placed them all over the house. You know, they were saying like each surge brings me closer to my baby and my body was designed to birth my baby. And I think seeing those little daily quotes just, um, it just really helped me learn to trust my body, which I just never really did before. It just gave me the confidence to know that like, yes, I can birth my baby in my home. (laughs) Like I can do this. I got in bed and I, I listened to my hypnobirthing meditations just all night. It was so peaceful and so calm and perfect. I remember just laying in bed and touching my husband's arm like every time I had a contraction and our little dog was curled up next to us. And, and I just remember thinking like, wow, this is, this is the last time that it's just going to be like us too, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like this is the last night where it's just going to be us and you know, we're going to meet our baby soon. And it was, it was just such a perfect night. And you were able to actually like lay down and get some rest or you were up pretty much all night? I napped in between contractions. I think I just, I just knew I needed to rest. I knew that my body is going to be in for <laughs> the ride of its life tomorrow. I was really calm throughout the whole thing, which kind of even surprised me because <laughs> like, I don't consider myself an incredibly like just calm and serene person. <laughs> but, you know, I was just like, I need to get in bed. I need to lay down. I'm just going to listen to my meditations. And yeah, that's what I did. And so I think just being in a, in a good mental state just really helped things just move along. And my midwife texted me at about, it was like 6 a.m. that morning and just asking how I was doing. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay. Like everything's really manageable. Like it's hard, but you know, I have my meditations. I'm, I'm doing good and I'm breathing. I, I'm okay. She's like, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll head over soon and, you know, see how you're doing. So everything was going well. And one thing that I realized later on that was interesting about my labor is I never had any internal checks. So I never knew how dilated I was. You know, sometimes like, oh, it was four centimeters and it was really, it was getting really hard. It's like, I had no idea. She was like, I won't do internal checks unless I think it's necessary. So, you know, I'm just going to let you labor in peace. And she just came in every 30 minutes to check baby's heart rate and then just kind of tiptoed out. Like it was just very, I guess if the word is maybe undisturbed, just, you know, I was in my bedroom with my husband. And at that point, I think we had kicked out Winston. <laughs> he, was, he wasn't providing a calm environment for us. <laughs> <laughs> That's the dog, just in case anyone forgot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, you know, I had, we had turned this room into like a little cave. Like it was dark. I think we only had two candles going and we have blackout curtains. So I had no idea what time it was, which I think is a good thing. Like, I don't need to be reminded that I was, I've been in labor for nine or 10 hours or however long it was. Um, But like I said, everything was just, it was really manageable and it was just peaceful. And I was like, you know, this is hard, but I can do it. And then I hit transition. (laughs) And that is when, I mean, it was, it was like someone had cranked up. Like if I was sitting pretty at a four, someone just cranked up the notch to like 40. And I was like, oh, this is why women get epidurals. Like, (laughs) this is why there's pain medication. Like, this is not manageable anymore. And I just started going over the options in my head. I was like, well, what are your options? And I was like, well, 
you didn't give yourself any. So are you going to go to the hospital? And that's no, not going to do that. I had so many just internal conversations <laughs> with myself. And then my next thought was, I was like, okay, like I just kind of started making deals with myself. I was like, okay, Ruby's just going to be an only child. Then you can get through this and then you never <laughs> have to do it again. You just, just get through it and you're done. You know, like I was an only child. Yes, I wanted a sibling when I was younger, but you know what? It's fine. I'm well adjusted. <laughs> like, you know, like I said, I just started making deals and I was like, this is just going to be it. And then I was like, oh, well, well, there's always adoption. We could always adopt. I'm adopted too. So, you know, and again, I'm fine. We could adopt. And then the next thought was like, no, like it was a very linear progression. <laughs> then it was like, no, I, I think next time I'll just like someone can just knock me out, cut the baby out of me, clean the baby off, and then wake me up and hand me the baby. That's how I'll do it next time. <sighs> and then I realized, it's like, as soon as I thought that, I was like, no, like, that isn't what you want. You want this. Like, this is birth, and birth is hard, but you're a woman, and you can do this. And so, you know, like, stop whining and birth your baby. <laughs> so after I gave myself that pep talk, I think that's maybe just what I – what had to happen for me. I just had to hit that low point where I was like, I don't know if I can do this. And that's when I realized I was like, oh my God, you're in transition. You're at that point where you saw in like all the videos and all the documentaries and on YouTube where like you hit the point where you don't think you can do it and you just got past it. So that's great. And it also means you're towards the end. That just gave me a renewed sense of energy. And I was just like, okay, like, you can do this. Like, you got this. <laughs> like, just giving myself pep talk after pep talk. And then my midwife came in and she was like, okay, uh, I'm going to call the second midwife. And that's when I knew I was like, oh, like, we're on the home stretch here, baby. Like, we got this. Because that's when I, I knew my midwife had told me before, you know, when I think you're getting close to delivering the baby, I'm going to call the second midwife. You know, she always has a second one so she can attend me or attend the baby if, you know, there's something, you know, should go I don't know, unplanned, <laughs> I'll say, after the birth. So I knew she was calling the second midwife. I was like, yes, let's just get in the birth pool and like, let's do this. Was that the first time you'd gotten in the pool? Oh, actually, no. I had been in and out maybe twice. I got really hot at one point. I was like, I got to get out. I got to get out. <laughs> so I just like laid on the bed and then I was like, okay, I'm going back in. And I was like, no, I got to get out. <laughs> but then I think I knew that last time because I knew I was towards the end. And I was just, I was like, all right, I'm just ready to do this. Like, let's do it. And then that's when the contractions started coming on just hard and fast. I didn't really have too much of a break between them. And that's when my quiet, serene, calm environment just <laughs> went tribal, basically. <laughs> and I started making the most like primitive sounds that I didn't even know I was capable of. But it just, I don't know, it just felt so natural. And still, even though it was really hard, it was still just wonderful. And, and I could feel her coming down. Her head started to come out and just thinking like, oh my God, this is it. I'm birthing my baby. Like this is happening right now. And I feel everything. <laughs> and I remember, you know, and just from all the videos that I had watched, uh, the head, you know, goes out and then it comes back in a little, and then it goes back out and then it comes back in. And I think by the fourth or fifth time that happened, I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> like, we're done here. You are absolutely not <laughs> going back in again. And I, even though, like, I knew that was supposed to happen, and I just, I was so done. And I just screamed. I was just like, get out. <laughs> and uh, it just, it so, it just reminded me. And then I kind of, I think I started laughing because it reminded me of this scene in Disney's Beauty and the Beast. Like, I don't know if you remember it, but there's this scene where, like, Beast finds Belle basically like finding that enchanted rose mm -hmm. and he flips out and he's <laughs> just like, what are you doing here? It's like, get out. And he just like yells and like reverberates throughout the castle and like Lumiere's candlesticks blow out and <laughs> like Belle flees in terror. And it's like, that's what that moment was for me. Like birth had brought out the beast. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God, I just turned into beast. <laughs> and yeah, and then she 
and she came out and oh, it was the most amazing feeling of just relief and ecstasy and just like I couldn't actually believe that that had just happened I mean because it happened so quickly and then I remember my midwife telling me to put my hands down in the water to pick her up and and I did and I lifted her out of the water and and I just held her and I was just like we did it (laughs) we did it and I love you and you're here and I kept on yelling, like, we did it. We did it. (laughs) I was like, it was a team effort. (laughs) You're here. And then I just screamed. I was like, what is it? (laughs) Because I didn't, like, I just picked her up. I didn't, it didn't even occur to me to look. Uh, I don't even think at that point I cared. I was just like, thank God it's over. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And my midwife had told me ages ago that she was like, you know, I'm not going to tell you the sex of your baby. Like, you should be the first one to find out. I love that idea. So when I screamed out, what is it? I was like, oh, oh, yeah, I need to look. So (laughs) I held her out. I looked down. But, you know, I was saying the room was very dark. I mean, my midwife had a flashlight. So we were just like I had I looked down and. I was like, oh my God, it's a girl. And then like I held her, I held her to my chest again and I hugged her. And then I was like, what? Well, I think it's a girl. Like, cause I just wasn't sure. Cause I was like, I need to be a hundred percent sure. Cause you know, the umbilical cord was still <laughs> attached. So I held her out again and I was like, it is, it is, it's a girl. It's like, get my mom. Cause uh, my mom had uh, flown over from Texas to be here for the birth and to help out, you know, after. <laughs> and so my mom came in the room and I was like, mom, it's a girl and her name is Ruby. And we had named her after my mom. So of course my mom started crying and, oh, it's just the most wonderful moment. Time stood still. I think there probably could have been like 300 other people in the room and I wouldn't have even noticed. I just, it was just me and her. I remember holding her and feeling her uh, little legs kick and recognizing those kicks uh, I was like, oh my gosh, those are the same little kicks I felt inside my belly and, and now I'm feeling them on the outside. And it just made the moment even more real. Like, you're here <laughs> and we did it <laughs> and it's over. <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful. You're making me cry. <laughs> so what did your, what was your husband doing this ta- this whole time? <laughs> I feel like I didn't really hear about him. He was amazing. I mean, I was... So it was like I was leaning, I was holding him basically, like I was holding him in a hug, like I, cause I was on my knees leaning over the edge of the birth pool and he was like on his knees on the outside and I just had my arms wrapped around him. So I was yelling in his ear, actually, I think I apologized to him afterwards. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize like that was right in your ear. He was like, that's okay. <laughs> I was like, all right, well, thank you. <laughs> so I was, I was holding on to him the entire time. Awesome. So then did you guys get out of the pool and have family cozy time in bed after that? We did. Yeah. Like, thank goodness. I was only like two steps away from my bed because I was just, oh, I was so exhausted yeah, we just laid in bed together and, you know, my midwife helped Ruby attach. And then she kind of just left us alone. She called it the golden hour, a time for, you know, me and, and Ruby to just bond. And it, it was so wonderful. And then, you know, she came back in and she's like, I think it's time we birthed the placenta, <laughs> which I had completely forgotten about. And I was like, what? I'm, I'm pretty tired. I don't think I can do anything else. But um, I was saying that I had a low-lying placenta. So it was a little harder to get out. Like that was really the only part of birth where I had to push. Because when I was pushing or like when, when she was coming out, like I didn't have to. The contractions were pushing her out. You know, like I just pushed because I was over it, (laughs) not because she needed assistance. But yeah, I really had to, like that was quite tough, like getting the placenta out. I wasn't expecting that. But I mean, it was all good and, and you know, and I birthed the placenta and (laughs) my midwife took it away to be encapsulated. I really think that there are a lot of benefits to that. I think if you talk to women who've actually done placenta encapsulation, like they'll just rave about it. So, I mean, and that's something I'll definitely do again. So you're not going to stop at one? (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) 
<laughs> Definitely not. Uh, <laughs> might stop at two. <laughs> I think that's that's the plan. But um, yeah, I have it in me to do it again. Definitely. Yeah, it sounds like once you got through that transition, it was... Right. I mean, it's still fresh. Don't get me wrong. Right. (laughs) (laughs) But I think give myself a year, I'll be all right. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you've mentioned a lot of different resources throughout our conversation, but are there any others that you recommend to pregnant or new mothers? You know, I did mention Ina May. She actually did a TED Talk. Uh, It's like TED Talk Sacramento, and it's on YouTube. I think I must have watched that 30 or 40 times. <laughs> it's almost like a birth pep talk. <laughs> so anytime I think I was getting nervous or like, I don't, can I do this? Like I can do this. Or like, I just, I need some Ina May right now. <laughs> <laughs> anytime I needed an Ina May fix, I would watch her TED talk on YouTube. That's fantastic. I actually haven't seen that. No one else has mentioned it either. So I'll watch that tonight. <laughs> it's great. And um, another thing, a documentary my midwife recommended was um, The Big Stretch. Uh, it's fantastic. And it, all it is, it's just showing, I think it's, I think it's in Australia, like Australian, New Zealand film. And it's just a documentary about home births. And it, I mean, and really all it is, is just different women giving birth at home. That's pretty much all it is. It just shows them going into labor and then delivering their baby. And so for me, that's what I needed. Like I needed to see women give birth. Like I needed to know what I was in for. I know that's definitely not for everybody, <laughs> you know, but for me, that's what I needed. And it really helped, you know, like, cause I was saying during transition, I think if I hadn't have known to expect that, not saying, I don't know if I could have gotten through it, but I don't, I think it, it might've been harder, you know, it might've just been like, oh my gosh, nope. I, I don't know if I can do this anymore, but you know, I knew that to expect it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That moment where you like think I'm going to die (laughs) knowing that you've seen other women get through it and that there's an end in sight. Exactly. And it's like, this is the part where we don't know if we can do it, but you can, you can do it. Like you can get through this and it means you're towards the end. So it's a good thing. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, thank you so much, Cassandra. Is there a final message that you would like to leave with our listeners today who might be planning for a home birth? Yeah, just a little tip. (laughs) So as far as mattress covers go, it's actually quite good to have a mattress cover, a set of sheets, another mattress cover, and then another set of sheets. (laughs) So after you get in your bed, after the birth, or I don't know, even if you birth your baby in your bed, then you can just, you know, rip those sheets off and then you have a fresh set with a fresh new mattress protector. Yes, my second midwife recommended that to us as well. And we used a shower curtain as the mattress protector. We just got like the cheap shower curtains. Yeah, that even works. It's just we would have never thought about that before. But like that's just a little handy tip (laughs) because then you don't have to worry about changing sheets, which my poor husband had to do while I was in the shower. (laughs) (laughs) So that's, yeah, just a little handy tip. And also I think I realized after... I gave birth to Ruby, you know, this might kind of sound obvious, but birth is something that it's just going to happen. And if you can just let it happen and accept the surges or waves or whatever you, you know, the contractions or whatever you want to call them and just surrender to them and, and let them win. You know, it's like a, it's like in a, like gambling, you know, like the house always wins. It's like the contraction will always win. <laughs> like you can fight it. You can, I mean, you can pray that it goes away. You can wish it goes away. Like it's not, it's not going to go away. So if you can just accept it and let it happen and just let birth happen to you, you don't really have to do anything. I think that's what I realized after I gave birth. Your body knows what to do my body did everything and my, and my baby, like they worked together and I just kind of had to relax as much as possible and let it happen. I love that. And you sound like more like a fourth time mom. <laughs> so much, so much like wisdom there. I told you I read a lot. Yeah, <laughs> was, you were prepared. I really was. I was a fanatic. And I mean, and this, it's, you know, it, it's changed me so much to the point that you know, when I do go back to work, um, cause I'm lucky enough to be able to stay home with Ruby right now. But when I do go back to work, I want to change fields. Like I want to get into maternal health. I mean, that's how much this whole process has changed me. 
it's such a beautiful thing. Oh, and another thing I forgot to mention is that I had prenatal acupuncture done. It was great. I always felt so relaxed afterwards. And my midwife um, on part of her team is um, a Chinese medicine practitioner. And, you know, I had an opening treatment after I had my fetal heart rate monitor strapped onto me. Pretty much starting at 34 weeks, I had a, an acupuncture session every week and it was, it was fantastic. And it's also a natural way to induce uh, labor. So um, I would I would recommend that like definitely go east before you go west with medicine was my uh, was my midwife's uh, saying as well. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Well, I think a lot of people probably come across the acupuncture to induce labor when they're getting a little anxious towards the end. There's lots of YouTube videos and stuff like that for um, acupressure points and stuff. But I know it is really amazing with helping with like your migraines and things like that during the pregnancy as well. Yeah, it is. And we, and we went over that as well um, with my husband and he was, yeah, such a sport <laughs> dealing, dealing with acupressure. Well, thank you again, Cassandra. It was really great. Oh, thank you for having me. Thanks again, Cassandra. If you want to connect with Cassandra, you can head to thebirthhour.com and find her show notes page where you can leave her comments and interact with her there. You can find me on Instagram at thebirthhour. And I want to give a little sneak peek that the episode on Thursday features a birth story that took place at the farm in Tennessee, which is the birthing center that Ina Mae Gaskin started. So I think it's going to be a really fun episode for a lot of people to hear that have followed Ina Mae and have read her books and have had her as an inspiration for their own birth experiences. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com to sign up for our newsletter. And if you really like the show, please subscribe and leave a review in iTunes. I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer, and you've been listening to another episode of The Birth Hour. Thanks again. And-